Coming in at number 5 we have the narwhal tusk. If any of you have ever seen the movie Elf then you're familiar with the cute narwhal in the beginning of the movie. And that movie really brought narwhals to the public's attention and making this sea creature more popular than ever before. But so much about this creature is a mystery. In 1577 the English explorer Martin Frobisher led an expedition of 150 men to the northern Canada in search of gold but they had come across something they had never intended and that was the sea unicorn. The myth of the unicorn goes back centuries and the business of unicorn horn trade was sustained through the middle ages and renaissance by vikings who killed the so called sea unicorns, cut off their horns and sold them for an astronomical price. As European naturalists became more familiar with the world's animal the myth of the unicorn faded, the mystery of the sea unicorn continued. Frobisher's discovery was actually what we know today as the narwhal but the horn itself continues to be speculated by many. But the horn is apparently not a horn at all but is a tooth. The relatives of narwhals include species like the beluga whales, orcas and dolphins but the mystery remains of how did this massive freakish tooth evolve in this one specific species after its ancestors branched off from whales with ordinary teeth. Many scientists and researchers debate about what this tooth is used for and some suggest it's an acoustic probe, a rudder, an ice picker or a spear for battling predators. These creatures don't make it easy for researchers to see them use their tusk for anything at all so it makes many people continue to question it. Many have come up with many different theories about this so called horn and what they use it for and why they have it. It has created a huge debate between researchers and scientists to this day but no definite answer has come out to this day. In at number 4 we have the submarine disappearances in 1968. This is one giant mysterious situation which is the disappearance of 4 submarines from 4 different countries in 1968. The USS Scorpion, a Soviet submarine K129, a French submarine Minerve and the INS Dhaka went inexplicably missing over just a 5 month period and the last 2 disappearing only 4 days apart. The exact causes of these sinkings remain unknown and remain a mystery over 50 years later. The INS Dhaka was scheduled to arrive in Israel on January 29th 1968. When it didn't return searchers went out to find it but after a while there was no sign of the missing submarine. So the search ended on February 4th and the 69 man crew was officially declared dead in 1981. The cause of the sinking was never determined and theories say that either a mechanical or human error caused a catastrophic accident or that the submarine snorkel was damaged after hitting another ship causing it to flood. The Minerve was on the training operation in the Mediterranean on January 27th 1968 and when they were on their way home the men were caught in a bad storm. When it was 30 miles away from the port the Minerve made contact with the men on land and said it would port in about an hour but an hour came and went and the submarine had never returned. A frantic search was conducted with 20 vessels and aircrafts trying to locate the Minerve but it was eventually called off on February 2nd when they found nothing. The K129 with a crew of 98 descended on March 8th 1968 and almost 2 weeks into patrol on the North Pacific the K129 failed to send a scheduled radio message. The Soviets soon began a frantic search and after 2 months of no sign of the submarine they gave up their search. The cause of the ship sinking remains unknown and will likely never be known. Almost 3 months after the K129 the USS Scorpion a nuclear powered attack submarine with a crew of 99 men went missing in the Atlantic while on its way back from a patrol in the Mediterranean. It was sent out on February 15th 1968 and toward the end of its patrol it radioed that it was expected to return on May 27th but as you can guess the USS Scorpion would never return. Like the others many searched for the lost ship but on June 5th the Scorpion and its crew were declared presumed lost. Over the years there have been multiple searches for these submarines but only parts have been recovered and it's considered one of the biggest mysteries that happened in the sea. No one knows why so many went missing in such a short amount of time, how exactly they went missing for so long and what exactly made these vessels disappear and this is a mystery we may never get the answer to. In at number 3 a suspected UFO. In 2011 a group of Swedish divers discovered a mysterious object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea which is a part of the Atlantic Ocean. The divers that were exploring the sea floor that came across the UFO shaped object had their equipment stop working as they approached the object. Professional diver Steven Hogenburn who is part of the Ocean X team said that some of the team's cameras and satellite phones refused to work when directly above the object and would only work when they were at least 200 meters away from the so called UFO. The Swedish diving team noted there was a 985 foot flattened out runway leading up to the object implying that it skidded along the path before stopping. Member Dennis Asberg said I am 100% convinced and confident that we have found something that is very 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 unique. 
Many of the divers were convinced that their finding was in fact a UFO, but some added theories that maybe the object could have been a meteorite or an asteroid, a volcano or a U-boat from the Cold War, but no one was really sure. The divers had returned to the site the next year to get a better look at the anomaly and had in fact found a second object near the first finding. They had taken a sonar image of the new finding due to mysterious electrical interference, it wasn't much of a clear image, and the group had only released the original finding image because the second finding was so blurry. With only a single blurry image and little information, many speculate that the object at the bottom of the Baltic Sea could in fact be a UFO, a portal into another world, or even an underwater Stonehenge. The theories received more attention when artist Hawk Vact had created a 3D interpretation of the mysterious object, which looks eerily similar to a UFO or something not of this world. On December 10, 2014, the website Earth We Are One actually published an article claiming a UFO shaped like a Millennium Falcon from Star Wars had been discovered at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and explained more about the dive and findings. We may never really know what this mysterious object truly is, and many believe it might be, but others believe it could be something else, but no one really knows. In at number two, we have Giant Eyeball. In 2012, a giant eyeball was found by a beachcomber in Pompano Beach in Florida, and this discovery is baffling wildlife officials. The softball sized eyeball was reported to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and then sent to the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in St. Petersburg to be put on ice so further analysis could be done to try and figure out what sea creature this eyeball had come from. Marine biologists will use genetic testing to try and solve this mystery and try and find an answer. When the picture came out of this mysterious eyeball, the internet went crazy and the mystery eyeball soon went viral, and some have suggested that the eye came from a monster fish, a giant squid, or even a whale. Many people are leaning towards the eyeball is from a giant squid, but the spokeswoman for the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, Carly Seckelson, said they are leaning toward a different scenario. The primary suspect right now would be a large fish like a swordfish, a tuna or some sort of deep water fish species. Heather Bracken Grissom, an assistant professor in the marine science program at Florida International University in Miami, believed that this huge blue eyeball may have come from a deep sea squid or a large swordfish. The professor and her colleagues concluded that the eyeball's lens and pupil are similar in shape to that of a deep sea squid, and noted that a deep sea squid's eyeball can be as large as a soccer ball and can easily become dislodged. After the marine biologist's test came back, they were still left with not many answers of what creature this eyeball came from, but it was determined to have bone fragments around it, debunking the theory of it being from a giant squid. Many different parts of different sea creatures have washed up or have been discovered by divers, but soon determined by marine biologists to be a specific sea creature or species, but this eyeball continues to be a mystery. This story just proves that we know very little about the ocean and who or what is swimming down there, especially in the deepest depths of the sea. And finally, in at number one, we have Icicle of Death or better known as the icy finger of death. It creeps through the ocean's depth like a frozen eel, an eerie phenomenon known as brine icicles. Brine icicles are most commonly called the icicles of death. It freezes everything it touches. Only discovered in the 1960s, these things grow towards the sea floor from the base of the Arctic and Antarctica sea ice. This phenomenon happens when extremely cold brine sink to the bottom of the water, reaching warmer seawater below. The water around it flash freezes, creating a descending tube of ice known as a brinicle. Sometimes an underwater icicle reaches the sea floor, and when it does, a web of ice forms and spreads, entombing and freezing everything in its path, including any unlucky sea life, such as a starfish and sea urchins. Andrew Thurber, professor at Oregon State University and avid diver, had actually seen a brinicle bloom firsthand and stated, they look like an upside down cacti that are blown from glass, like something from Dr. Zeus's imagination. They're incredibly delicate and can break with only the slightest touch. The formation of a brinicle was first filmed in 2011 by producer Catherine Jeffs and cameraman Hugh Miller and Doug Anderson for the BBC series Frozen Planet. They can even create brine pools, which are called the Black Pool of Death, and are toxic to marine animals due to their high salinity and anoxic properties, which can lead to toxic shock and possibly death. Based on what scientists have learned so far, they believe life on Earth may have originated from these tentacles and that they may even harbor conditions suitable for life to form on other planets and moons. Number 5. Giant Isopods No, this isn't a microscopic picture. This isn't a tick or a bug. This is a giant isopod. One of the scariest looking things picking around the ocean floor. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Imagining this thing wiggling around is enough to already be giving me the willies. Don't worry too much. You're not too likely to find one of these things crawling around 
around your home, as they usually live and feed about 1600 feet beneath the ocean depths. So you'll have to really go looking for one of these creepy little crawlies. We don't know a lot about isopods, actually. It's difficult to study them in their habitat unbothered deep in the ocean. And also, if I had to guess, I think realistically it's because no one wants to spend any more time looking at one of these little zerglings longer than they have to. Despite their outward appearance, isopods are actually pretty chill. That's the official scientific statement, judging a book by a cover and all that. They're scavengers more than they are predators, waiting at the bottom of the sea for debris to reach them, like discarded bits of meat from crabs or any number of fish which they'll snack on. So basically, they're the moochers of the ocean, waiting for somebody else to do all the work and they'll just uh, clean up the leftovers. It apparently isn't even that big a deal, though, because isopods have been observed to be able to go years and years without eating anything at all, with some reports going as far as five years without eating anything. I could not even imagine the Anger you would feel through that. Enjoying what we're putting out at Top 5 Scary? Of course you are, that's why you're here. Why not toss a cheeky little subscribe our way as a way of saying thanks? We'll trade you the best scary videos this side of the web in exchange. Number 4. Barrel Eye Fish Has anyone ever accused you of being empty headed? I know that's something I've heard a lot in my time, I don't really know what that means. Unfortunately, my head hollow as it might be, does not allow you to see inside because I am not a barrel eye fish, a being which is cursed to have a window for a forehead. The barrel eye fish may be one of the most confusing looking things under the sea. I, I mean, take a look at this thing. It kind of looks like it's not finished yet, you know? Like this fish was late for school and it forgot to put its face on. It's got its eyes inside its head and has a translucent head to accommodate that. You know, the rest of all life uh, thought, eyes on the outside, but the barrel eye just had to stand out and be different. Those two big green orbs are the fish's eyes, tinted with a sort of biological sunglasses kind of deal to help it zero in on light above it. The barrel eye uses its bizarre eyes to look upwards, tracking the shadows of its prey and then fixating on it. You wouldn't expect a creature that looks this weird to be an effective predator at all. Special organs on the fish's belly called souls deflect light from the creature's insides, illuminating the deep sea around it and also letting it camouflage. So this weirdo transparent head fish is also a mobile swimming light show. Just goes to show how absolutely amazing life down in the abyss is, where creatures will naturally adapt to their surroundings to evolve to have a flashlight built in them. Bless you, barrel eye fish. Bless you for being you. Number three on this list is a color change. Now, a color change doesn't really sound that scary at all, but in this particular case, it's definitely pretty creepy. A diver writes, I was diving off the coast of Fiji and we went through a natural tunnel, like a 10 meter cave slash passage through a rock formation. So we start swimming through the cave and suddenly the light was weird, like the blue tint from the water has been replaced by a red one. Now all divers will know that this isn't only weird because the color changed, but also because red is the first color to disappear after a certain depth, usually between 30 to 40 feet, and we were well over 70 feet. Also bear in mind this was late morning on a sunny day. So imagine this scene, me and my dive buddy are going through an underwater cave and suddenly everything, for no apparent reason, is tinted red, a color that you are literally supposed to be unable to see while diving at that depth during the day. Upon exiting the cave, everything was back to blue. I thought it was just me, so I didn't signal to go back up. After the dive, my buddy asked me if I'd seen the water tint red as well. We can't explain it, and the folks from the local dive shop had no idea what we were talking about. Now that story is super weird. We've got to keep in mind that these guys were 70 feet below the surface at that point. If I was 70 feet below the surface and everything changed colors to a deep red, I would be very scared for my life. Obviously we don't know for sure, but it sounds like that cave that they stumbled upon is haunted by something. It's either haunted by something or that particular cave can produce some strange light phenomenon. Either way, it would have been very frightening and I'm glad that the two divers in this story made it out okay. Number two on this list is a school of sharks. The next discovery comes in from a professional diver in the Bahamas who was diving down to recover a dead body. What's crazy about this story is that the dead body isn't the scary part. His online name is Keith Bell uh, and he writes, After an hour or two of searching, I went back into the blue hole to see if there were any signs of him. Saw the glint of his watch and his arm sticking out near the bottom. Started descending down to the bottom to recover the body. On the way down, realized that the bottom was a school of sharks that must have been there for breeding. So many sharks that they blocked the view of the actual bottom. Descended into darkness, grabbed his arm, couldn't stand to look at the body, and started ascending. 
The sharks followed and were circling around the both of us. Had to take a break at halfway at around 60 feet as to not get the bends. Extremely scared. The entire time waiting to normalize being super scared. Victim was struck by a passing boat. So not only is finding a dead body underwater super scary in my opinion, but to stumble upon so many sharks that you can't even see the bottom of the ocean, that's beyond terrifying. Then to have said sharks follow you up to the surface, deciding whether or not they're going to eat you would have been absolutely brutal. He didn't specify what type of sharks they were, but after doing some research, sharks tend to get far more aggressive during mating and therefore the risk of our divers getting attacked is significantly increased. Also, the number of sharks that can gather during mating season can rise into the hundreds. One shark is scary enough and will likely win in a fight, but tens to even hundreds of them would have easily had their way with this diver. Not sure about you guys, but if that was me, I would be exclusively a land dweller from then on out. Number one on this list is a person. People aren't typically scary discoveries, but in this case by some deep sea divers, it definitely was. One diver writes, me and two buddies were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1 a.m. and we're a good 100 feet deep, the darkest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Only this time, we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort, so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1 a.m. and we'd see nobody else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone, which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold, but this dude was in a wetsuit with exposed skin. We thought we saw a giant gash on one of his legs. So the three of us all notice him and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs and the guy just smiles, waves, and then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up like in an alley at night, it's weird. A hundred feet underwater at night is terrifying. After reading this story, I got some serious ghost vibes. Now obviously I can't know for sure and those divers didn't either, but this man just appeared out of nowhere and had a giant gash on his leg. He also wasn't wearing the proper gear and they didn't see him enter the water when they were getting ready to go. Potentially, rather than just be another diver out and about, this is the ghost of someone who went diving and died. Now their spirit just swims through the ocean for eternity. I've read a lot of ghost stories and reports of sightings before, and that has all the telltale signs of one. Coming in at number five, we have Stranded Ship. In Zakynthos, Greece, on the beautiful beaches lays a haunting sight of a stranded and rusting MV Panagiotis ship washed up on the shore in 1980 and continues to lay on the sand to this day. Many tourists come to view this phenomenon and due to the mysterious ship it's been nicknamed Shipwreck Beach. Little is known about the ship and is highly debated. One theory is that the ship was used for smuggling and abandoned when the crew were being pursued by the navy on their way to Piraeus from Albania. Another theory states that the ship was making its way from Turkey with the freight of contraband cigarettes headed for Italy. When encountering stormy weather, the ship went into a cove where the crew abandoned the ship in fear of getting caught. Soon after the ship was abandoned, rumors started swirling that the ship had many valuable items on it and authorities eventually convicted 29 people for looting cargo and valuable equipment from the wrecked ship. The location of the Panagiotis was prominently featured in the hit Korean drama Descendants of the Sun, leading to a surge of interest among Chinese and Korean tourists. This beach was briefly closed for tourists in 2018 due to the fear of landslides due to a large boulder falling onto the beach, but left the ship unharmed. The beach was later opened and that same year the beach was named as the world's best beach in a poll by over 1,000 travel journalists and professionals. The beach and surrounding areas are stunning but the mysterious of the ship lingers and gives creepy vibes when you're on vacation in such a beautiful place. Some tourists have stated while getting close to the ship they've heard noises coming from inside and some locals believe that this ship is haunted by the past crew members. In at number 4 we have numerous lost cities. One of the most famous lost cities that have been located in the ocean is the lost city of Atlantis. The lost city used to actually consist of a few islands where the founders had created a utopian civilization and became a great naval power. 
harbour. Their home consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked by a canal. The Island of Gods contained gold, silver and other precious metal and had an abundance of rare and exotic wildlife. Many believe Atlantis and the story behind it was a fictional story that was created by an ancient Greek philosopher Plato, but others believe it was a real story and that the lost city is supposedly located in the Atlantic Ocean, while others say it's the Mediterranean or under Antarctica. And this is a popular debate. Besides the highly debated Atlantis, there are currently at least a dozen lost cities that rest at the bottom of the ocean near places like Greece, Japan and India. The sunken palace of Cleopatra is one of the most fabled underwater remnants of the ancient world. It had sunken more than 1400 years ago when an earthquake and tsunami hit Alexandria, Egypt. One of the most spectacular and intact lost cities is Shicheng, or otherwise known as the Lion City, which is located at the bottom of China's Quandeo Lake. Not from ancient times, but apparently it was purposefully flooded in 1959 to make room for a dam and an adjoining hydroelectric station. Another lost city comes from Dwarka, India, which is known as the Gateway to Heaven, which was an ancient city dating back as far back as 574 AD. The ancient Dwarka was sunken by the rising of the ocean levels and taken to the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Cambay. Marine archaeological explorations have shed light on the structures and other artifacts these ancient people lived in. Many things have been seen and recovered like ancient structures, grids, pillars, stone anchors, pottery, stone sculptures, bronze, copper and so much more. Next up at number 3, the Mary Celeste, which in fact may very well be the world's most infamous ghost ship as well as one of the longest enduring mysteries of the seven seas. Built in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia in 1861 and launched under the new name of the Mary Celeste in 1868, this merchant brigantine sailed uneventfully across the Atlantic for years as a seaworthy efficient vessel. It wasn't until her fateful voyage in 1872 where the true ghostly legend began, which has since gathered theories that vary from submarine earthquakes, water spouts, an attack by a giant squid and even paranormal intervention. No one will truly know the ultimate fate of the Mary Celeste with every single soul on board never being seen or heard from again, which is a terrifying thought in itself, isn't it? The Mary Celeste was discovered adrift and deserted just off the coast of the Azores Islands on December 5th, 1872. It was a Canadian vessel, the De Gratia, which found her in a dishevelled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with one lifeboat missing. The last entry in the ship's log was dated 10 days earlier which detailed the vessel's last known location, before these mysterious infamous events unfolded. On board was the ship's captain Benjamin S Briggs, his wife Sarah and their two year old daughter Sophia and eight seasoned crew members, all veterans of the sea. It poses the question what dire threat did the Mary Celeste face that caused a highly experienced captain to abandon his ship. Nothing was stolen, all of the crew's possessions and cargo were exactly as they'd left them, but in all likelihood, we may never know. Swinging in at number two, the Flying Dutchman. Of course, this legendary vessel couldn't not make this list. The ghost ship that can tragically never make port, doomed to navigate the perilous ocean for eternity. In actual fact, though, the Flying Dutchman has had such an impact on nautical culture that it's easy to overlook the treacherous tale of its origin. It is thought that the legend of the Flying Dutchman first originated from the 17th century golden age of the Dutch East India Trade Company, a mega corporation that had a stranglehold monopoly on the Dutch spice trade that ran throughout the 16 and 1700s, where tale was told of a Dutch man of war that was lost just off the Cape of Good Hope. Purportedly, every soul on board perished after being ravaged by a violent tempest. The following few days, numerous other trading ships reported seeing a ghostly, ethereal vessel out in the foggy mist of the ocean, flying the exact same colours as the Dutch vessel. Since then, the Flying Dutchman has gathered notoriety as the worst omen you could ever hope for of a phantom ship that heralds the demise of an entire crew. Crew, with sightings continuing all the way into the 19th and 20th centuries. In fact, perhaps the most recognised sighting was by King George V himself during a three year voyage in 1881 just off the coast of Australia. He noted in his personal log that 13 people had seen the same glowing flying Dutchman in the early hours of the morning, and later in the day, the ordinary crewman who had spotted the vessel fell from the foremast and, in his words, was smashed to atoms. It's a little bit worrying that one. Eh? And finally our number one spot, 
the Orang Medan. And where do we even begin with the bizarre, perplexing legend of the Orang Medan, perhaps the most terrifyingly unexplainable instances of a ghostly shipwreck in history? But well, the leading physical theory of the Orang Medan may be even more horrifying than it first appears. As the legend goes, at some time in June 1947, an American vessel by the name of the Silver Star picked up several distress calls from a nearby Dutch merchant ship, the Orang Medan. A radio operator aboard the troubled vessel sent a message in Morse code. In rushed, confused dots and dashes, it read, We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. And then a few moments later, after even more confused dots and frantic dashes, two words came through very clearly. I die. Then silence. Nothing more was heard of them. But well, when the Silver Star eventually located and boarded the apparently undamaged and otherwise seaworthy Orang Medan, what they found absolutely horrified them. Every single person aboard was found dead, sprawled on their backs, frozen in fear with their mouths gaping open and their eyes staring straight ahead. There were no survivors, but even more terrifying, apparently no signs of injury or foul play. Just as the Silver Star crew was preparing to tow the ship to a nearby port, a fire broke out in the Orang Medan, which shortly exploded before finally sinking into the depths. Since this horrifying incident, theories have ranged from the vessel carrying a highly dangerous chemical nerve agent, to an entanglement with the CIA after a result of a secret experiment, to an unprovoked alien assault. But if you haven't already sensed the theme with this particular list, it seems that we may never know. Number 5 on this list is a giant eel. This is a true story that comes in from a reddit user RCMW181. They write, an old World War II ammunition ship off the south coast of England was full of brass topped shells. Most had been taken by divers over the years and it was now very rare to see them apart from a pile in one corner of the ship. The pile of shiny brass metals was miraculously untouched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater and you only found out why if you swam near them. Out of the murky darkness the largest eel I have ever seen snakes forward. Without exaggeration this thing had a head the same size as a horse horse's head full of jagged teeth. I could not see the body as it looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. Turns out for years this thing had been guarding the shiny brass shells, slithering over them making them shine. We found out at a bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said eels are like magpies and like shiny things. There are multiple scary discoveries in this story in my opinion. First off, our reddit user just glosses over the fact that they're in a sunken World War II munitions ship. They don't say so, but I would have imagined that people would have died on that ship when it sunk, and there may have even been some remains of the dead still down there. Then to come face to face with a giant eel that is extremely protective over these brass shells would be terrifying. If that was a giant moray eel, then those creatures can grow up to two and a half meters in length and can be very deadly in the water. Had that creature interpreted what our diver was doing as threatening, and they may not have made it to shore later that day to be able to share the story. Number 4 on this list is a freezer. This story from a reddit user is just all kinds of creepy. Count underscore dynamo writes, I've done a number of dives and the strangest thing I ever saw was a large deep freezer with a heavy industrial chain wrapped around multiple times with about 5 cinder blocks attached. It was very rusted and the deep freezer itself had to have been 30 years old, probably more. This was about 90 feet just off of Vancouver Island, Canada. The situation gave myself and the other divers the heebie jeebies. Logged the GPS and depth coordinates and notified the police. We were able to find out what was inside since one of the divers had friends with the local police. 10 porcelain dolls. Now for starters, I'm actually kind of happy that they found porcelain dolls inside that freezer because when I was initially reading that story and heard about a freezer that was locked up and weighed down. I initially thought of a dead body, but having 10 porcelain dolls raises a lot of questions. Were these dolls potentially cursed and that was the only way to get rid of them? If you've ever come in contact with a cursed doll, then locking it up is the first thing to do. Ed and Lorraine prove it with their handling of the Annabelle doll. If these dolls are cursed though, then this discovery gets even more scary. Clearly whoever locked them in that freezer threw them to the bottom of the ocean and didn't want them to be found, bringing them back up to the surface probably wasn't the best idea. Number 3. Sarcastic Fringe Head At first glance and description, the sarcastic fringe head doesn't sound particularly horrifying. It looks about as funky as most things you would see in an aquarium. 
And the name might make you wonder a little bit if it's got a reputation for being sassy, like maybe this is the fish that's always backhandedly complimenting you. Which would be terrifying in its own right, but not for the reasons we tend to highlight on this channel. No, the sarcastic name comes from the fish's kind of dour expression, and I definitely do see where that's coming from, because looking at photos of me, it looks like it's judging me just a little bit for my life's choices. Now when this fish opens its mouth, you'll understand why it earned a spot here. The sarcastic fringe head's mouth can open up wider than its body, creating this delicious delightful image you see here, and you will probably be seeing for the rest of your days. Now if you're a little freaked out looking at this fish that looks like it crawled out of the upside down, that's understandable. But what if I told you that these fish have kiss fights? Sarcastic fringe heads fight for dominance with other fringe heads by expanding their very wide mouths and then pressing them together as a display to show who's got the biggest mouth. This is also how they attract mates, fighting off other fish and smacking their lips together to impress all the lady fringe heads, showing them just how wide their mouths go and man it has taken so much restraint right now to be talking about this and trying to keep this at a PG rating. Number 2. Frilled Shark A frilled shark, all things considered, sounds pretty cute. Maybe you're picturing a shark with lovely frills hanging off of it like some other fish have, like a cool fringe denim jacket. Or maybe you're picturing a shark wearing something lacy and frilly. I'm not gonna judge, you do whatever you'd like. Unfortunately, neither of those fantasies are particularly accurate, because like everything else on this list, the frilled shark is an abomination of the ocean. It's already unnerving enough to look at, serving massive alien vibe, the James Cameron kind, not the friendly little gray man kind. And then it opens its mouth and you understand where the name comes from as you're treated to a mouth of 300 thrilled razor sharp teeth like barbed wire. Just like the alien, they're able to open their jaws real wide to be able to snarf down prey considerably greater than their size, although exactly how much larger is unknown. These little terrors hunt by swimming around with their maw open and using the darkness to try and lure smaller prey right into a trap before being engulfed by what looks like the world's sharpest car wash. I genuinely can't even look at this thing's mouth for too long without starting to feel a little bit queasy, imagining it biting into anything. The frilled shark is considered a living fossil, much like the coelacanth because in the 80 million years frilled sharks have been swimming across our planet, they haven't changed much. Like, at all. They more closely resemble prehistoric creatures than any of their contemporary shark counterparts. All that to say is, I guess, whatever nature was cooking with the frilled shark, clearly they got something right. They, they nailed it if they, if they saw this thing for 80 million years and thought, absolutely no changes. This one's perfect. Number 1. Colossal Squid At our number 1 spot is a living legend, the Colossal Squid. Thought for many years to be an urban legend due to their elusive nature, for a long time not much was known about these cephalopods other than the fact that they are very, 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 very large. Reports of giant squids describe them as being anywhere up to a staggering 65 feet long, but collected squids range in at a much more humble 42 feet long. Oh. Okay, well that's, I was getting worked up over nothing. Humans and colossal squids don't particularly cross paths often, what with them living 3,000 feet under the sea. And that is definitely a good thing, because these squids are not something you would ever want to mess with. Its tentacles are lined with sharp hooks to sink into their prey and prevent them from getting away. Alongside the usual suckers that squid's tentacles have, hard toothy like rings that dig into prey and keep them wrangled. It's common to find whales covered in these scars, or slashes and shreds from the hook of a giant squid. The thought of being being grabbed by these tentacles is enough to stop me from ever ordering calamari again. What with being one of the bigger monsters swimming around down there, the colossal squid doesn't have much in the way of predators. I guess that's uh, kind of one of the benefits of being a 40 foot monstrosity. People stop messing with you, you know? People stop trying to pick on you. They start respecting you more and no one tries to eat you anymore once you're, you know, bigger than anything else down there. Number 5 on this list is the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie, as many people refer to this creature, is said to be a huge, long-necked, almost dinosaur-looking creature that lives in Scotland. This creature of the deep specifically resides in Loch Ness, a 37-kilometer loch located in the Scottish Highlands. The legend of this sea creature went worldwide back in 1933. A photo was released to the public showing a strange creature's head protruding from the water of Loch Ness. The world went into a frenzy after that photo got out and the legend of Nessie began. Ever since that point, many sightings have been reported, other pictures have been taken, and even sonar readings have indicated this creature swimming in the loch. All of that being said though, we've never had indisputable proof that Nessie's real. Well, I'm here to tell you that Nessie is real, but maybe not how you expect. New Zealand scientists have taken samples of the water in Loch Ness and have studied the DNA that they found in it. Professor Neil Gamel, a geneticist, is quoted saying, 
Well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material that says we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness Monster might be a giant eel. So, the Loch Ness Monster, as we understand it, might not be real, but potentially this loch is full of giant eels that resemble all the features that Nessie's reported as having. Maybe this is why we've had such a hard time proving this myth, because for years, people have been looking for the wrong thing. I really like the legend of the Loch Ness Monster and honestly want it to be true, but if it had to be giant eels, then I think I could accept that as well. Number four on this list is the USS Stein Monster. The USS Stein was a Knox-class destroyer ship in the United States Navy. The ship was eventually decommissioned from the American Navy and was transferred to the Mexican Navy in the 90s. That wasn't before it was attacked by a massive sea monster though. In 1978, the USS Stein was attacked by an unknown entity which we now refer to as the USS Stein Monster. This monster was said to have been a giant, with some people estimating its size up to 150 feet in length. The ship was sailing in the Pacific Ocean when it was attacked. Technical difficulties with the ship started going wrong and eventually they brought it back into the port. Upon inspection, the sonar system was completely damaged. There were cuts and gashes over 8% of the ship, with some of them being massively deep. They also found suction cups like those of a squid attached to the ship. After investigation of the suction cups and the gashes, it became clear that what they were attacked by isn't your standard animal. Even a giant squid would have had a hard time doing what the monster did to the ship. Ever since that point, the legend of the USS Stein monster has grown. Obviously, this monster has to be real because it has actually attacked a ship. Sadly, we don't know a whole lot about it though. In truth, we know less about what's on the ocean floor than we do about the surface of the moon. So it's very possible that a creature we aren't familiar with yet is dwelling down there. Number three on this list is a kelp forest. Duct Tape Jedi writes, After a day of boat diving in Monterey Bay on the California coast, we had a night dive planned. I was there with two friends celebrating my birthday and we were part of a larger group of divers. My friends were too tired for the night dive and I was too, but I got invited to buddy with another diver whose friends also decided to stay on the boat. So I was following my new buddy through the kelp when some of it caught on my tank. I tried to pull clear but managed to get tangled even more to the point where I was unable to move. I kept shining my light around looking for my buddy but he was nowhere to be seen. After what seemed like an hour but was possibly just a few minutes, I felt some of the kelp loosen up and then saw that my buddy was cutting it off with a knife. I was so exhausted after struggling that when we got to the surface, he had to tow me back to the boat. So discovering a full on kelp forest, I mean that would honestly be really cool I think. Obviously what happened to our diver would have been incredibly scary though. Having to wrestle for over an hour or however long he was there for with some kelp in the dark, probably thinking that you're going to drown, doesn't sound great. But if you did discover a kelp forest and that didn't happen, then I think it'd be pretty sweet. If you're going to go though, then make sure you carry your own knife because you wouldn't want to end up like our friend here. Number two on this list is a body. This story is from Texas Guy 911 and he says, I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced cave divers than I was. I'm leading the dive as to get used to the pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession and they're mentoring me. The known horrible visibility makes it impossible to navigate by compass, so we follow a line put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So I know I'm about to hit a small sunken boat, but I don't remember which one. There are a few similar in a row in the same state of decay. I'm the first in the group and I get to the boat and I see someone's black army boots sticking out from the inner quarters. It looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. It's hard to see due to so much muck in the water. So I touch the boot, thinking it's by itself, but it won't lift. Like it's attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and now I see the second leg. I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascend to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face. Nobody wants to go to the surface, but it's a rule that if one says up, others in the group must abort no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what's a diver's sign for a corpse? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though I'm trying to stay calm and take time. So we're on the lake surface. I have this adrenaline rush, can't breathe enough. So I tell them there's a body down there. 
I see rolling eyes from everyone once they see I'm serious. I describe in detail what I saw and then we go down again. Once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backward as there are several boats on the line and who knows in which boat the body is in and how far we drifted while taking it out on the surface. Well, we find all the boats before seeing the original one, of course. So, our customary leader goes into the boat's cabin and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So, gluing information together from what we learned later on, it actually turns out the police or some other agency had body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed, anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safekeeping. So, that didn't turn out to be an actual body, but I still think this would have been super scary. To feel a leg and then another leg in the darkness of the water like that on one of your first dives, uh, I mean, that would be a lot. Maybe I'm just weak because deep sea diving is just not for me, but honestly, that would have scarred me for potentially life, whether the body is real or not. Number one on this list is a survivor. Off the coast of Nigeria roughly eight years ago, a tugboat broke down and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Three whole days later, a diving crew went out to the wreckage to see what was down there and recover the dead bodies. It was thought that no one could have possibly survived the crash and that all 12 people on the boat were dead. That's why the crew was so shocked when they found someone had actually survived. Maybe this doesn't seem as scary as finding someone who had died, but we're lucky enough to have the actual clip of them recovering this person and just watch as the hand comes out. All right, you found one, yeah? He's alive, he's alive. He's alive. The startled dive team discovered the tugboat's cook had survived for three days. So that one image of having a hand reach out of the dark and stormy nothing would have actually terrified me. Not to mention that man who survived down there. That would have been three days by himself surviving in this tiny air pocket, most likely believing that the world has left you for dead. This is definitely one of those scary discoveries that's for the better, because someone's life was saved, but as the Reddit user Edgar writes, I can't imagine how creepy and unexpected it would be to be on a mission to recover the dead and have a hand reach out to you like it did. Starting us off at number five, we have Yellow Jack. We're gonna set sail on a weird one to start us off. If you're a flag enthusiast, you might see the ending of this one coming from a mile away, but we'll get there in a minute. So the legend of Yellow Jack starts upon a spice and gold filled ship preparing to leave the Indies and head back home. The crew was accounted for, the cargo was secure, the captain was feeling Mwah, nice. Then, at the last second, a mysterious figure asked if they had room for one more. Feeling pretty good about their haul, they welcomed this extra pair of helping hands on board. Wrong move. Turns out this was a disreputable lad known as Yellow Jack, with a reputation so abhorrent that the ship was forbidden to enter any port she called upon. For ages, the crew sailed from port to port, hoping that someone would let them dock, but it never happened. They were forced to endlessly cruise the seas, running lower and lower on supplies. Patience, too. Eventually, the crew went mad and committed mutiny before they all murdered each other. Some say the ship is still sailing, the ghosts of these sea locked sailors manning the helm. Someday they may find a port that will take them and they will finally be able to rest. In the meantime, they will sail the seas, infecting other ships with the same madness that Yellow Jack caused. Now this is a spooky, ghostly story in its own right, but it could also be a reference to a different ship killer at the time. Disease. The Yellow Jack is a flag flown by ships infected with plague, cholera, and other nasty, fast spreading diseases. So, Yellow Jack itself could be a metaphor for disease, and ports weren't letting them in because of quarantine procedures. Absolutely fascinating, and it would also make a killer movie a pirate quarantine body horror. Think The Thing meets Wreck meets Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh damn. Coming in at number 4, we have the Caliucci, a Chilean ship sailing around an island known for its terrible storms. Shining white sides, three masts with five sails, blood red. The ship sails independent of any human input. 
Sure, there's a ghost crew, but the Caliucci is known for being sentient. The ship has a mind of its own. It'll glide along the water at incredible speeds and is able to submerge and continue navigating underwater, similar to the famous Flying Dutchman. When it passes, folks say you can hear the crew cackling for a brief moment. It's a ship known for the merriment of its ghostly crew. They throw parties often and hop around on one leg. The folks on board often only have one leg because the other is folded behind their back, similar to another Chilean mythological entity. Top off their strange looks and mannerisms, some crew members have backwards faces, terrifying all who lay eyes upon them. Some say the Caliucci is manned by sailors both dead and alive, dragged from the depths and snagged off passing ships. Another legend says that the ship is piloted by the souls of the drowned, brought aboard by water spirits and granted the gift of life in exchange for their servitude. Not so sure that's a good deal, you know, life eternal, but you'll always be on a stinky ship. Maybe the parties are just that sick. Merchants who trade with Caliucci supposedly become very wealthy afterwards, and anyone who has laid eyes upon it wears a crooked smile forever. Again, interesting deal. Lots of money, crooked smile. I guess you could afford a dentist and some plastic surgery at that point. Number three on this list is Megalodon. Would this list really be complete if I didn't include the ancient king of the sea? Eleanor Imster writes, Scientists think that Megalodon looked like a stockier version of the great white shark, with strong, thick teeth built for grabbing prey and breaking bones. Regarded as one of the largest and most powerful predators who have ever lived, fossil remains of Megalodon suggest that this giant shark reached a length of about 60 feet. Their large jaws could exert a bite force up to 24,000 to 41,000 pounds. That is a massive, massive animal, guys. Multiple times bigger than the great white sharks we have today. This thing was so big that it would actually eat entire whales. Now many myths have surrounded Megalodon and its existence since scientists first brought this mammoth of the sea up. Estimates say that Megalodon went extinct roughly 2.6 million years ago, but some people don't buy into that theory. For quite a while now, the legend of a giant shark still living amongst the ocean has had a lot of people wondering if it's possible. If Megalodon was still alive, is it possible that we still wouldn't know about it? How could we miss a creature this giant? How many of them would there be left in the waters? There are surely a lot of questions that come up if you believe Megalodon is still a reality. If this creature was still alive, then people think the Marianas Trench is where it's located, a place so deep and uncharted that it's hard for us to know for sure what's down there. I'm personally not convinced this creature still roams the ocean, but comment down below your thoughts. Is Megalodon still alive? What do you think? Number two on this list is the Kraken. The Kraken is one of the largest sea monsters that is said to exist. It all started in Nordic folklore many hundreds of years ago when sailors told tale of a massive beast that preys upon the waters of Norway, Greenland, and Iceland. This fearsome beast was said to pull entire ships to their doom and eat every human on board. The first account of the legend was in 1180 by the King of Norway at the time. Since then, sightings of the creature and lore surrounding its capabilities have grown through the years. Fiction writers and movie makers have also latched onto this creature and included it in many stories. As cool as it would be though, to our current knowledge, the Kraken itself isn't real. However, something similar to it definitely is. The Giant Squid. The Giant Squid is a massive squid that's said to be able to grow up to 13 meters in length. Sightings have even put this creature at 20 meters before, but those have never been proven. Even if 13 meters is the maximum length, that's still a large animal and something that would frighten anyone if you're seeing it for the first time. Many experts believe that the legend of the Kraken happened when Norwegian sailors stumbled upon this giant squid, and rather than name it a giant squid, they called it the Kraken. As time went on, the legend spiraled out of control until we got this massive sea monster which attacks boats. Now even though that might be a bit far from the truth, could I believe that there was one giant squid that was potentially bigger than the rest? Absolutely I could. I could also believe that this giant squid might have attacked a ship or two in its time and maybe even brought one down. If it did do all of that, then there really wouldn't be any difference between this squid and the Kraken. Either way, if you see a massive sea creature with tentacles coming after you, i just swim the opposite direction. Number one on this list is the Hook Island Sea Monster. It was first spotted by Robert Le Sarek in 1964 off of Hook Island and after he saw the monster, he went on to describe it in detail. He said, 
It was only when we got to within 20 feet of the serpent that we could see its head clearly. The head was large, about 4 feet from top to bottom with jaws about 4 feet wide. The lower jaw was flat like that of a sandfish. The skin was smooth but rather dull, brownish black in color. The eyes seemed pale green, almost white. The skin looked more like that of a shark than an eel. There were no apparent scales nor did we see any parasites around. We supposed the flexible tail would have shaken any off. There were no fins or spines, nor were there any apparent breathing openings, although there must have been some. Perhaps we didn't see them because our attention was focused mainly on the creature's menacing mouth, the inside of which was whitish. The teeth appeared to be small. A fragment of some dark substance hung from the upper row of teeth, possibly a fish. As the monster was lying on the sandy bottom, we could not see the color of its belly. The creature was about 90 feet long. Behind the head, the body was about 2 feet 4 inches thick and remained that way for about 25 feet. Feet. Then it gradually tapered into a whip like tail. The general color of the body was black with one foot wide brownish rings every five feet. The first starting just behind the head. The skin was smooth but dull. So that's his description and after he and his family saw it, he took some pictures of the creature to prove his claims. We have to remember that these pictures were taken in 1964 and doctoring them would have been far more difficult back then than it is today. I also tend to believe this claim more than most based on the level of detail he described the beast. Obviously it was pretty jarring experience if he was able to describe the creature in that much detail. Since the claims, people have researched Hook Island for this monster, but with no luck. Hopefully one day we can spot this monster again and know for certain that it truly exists. Kicking off at number 5, the Kaz 2, which perhaps is one of the most terrifying modern instances of the term ghost ship and one of the most profoundly tragic unsolved mysteries of the deep blue sea. The Kaz 2, which was publicly dubbed the Ghost Yacht, was a 9.8 meter catamaran which was found drifting listlessly 88 nautical miles off the northeastern coast of Australia on the 20th of April 2007. The three men aboard, who were all residents of Perth in Western Australia, were all incredibly experienced sailors. They were 56 year old Derek Batten and brothers Peter Tunstead and James Tunstead, who were 69 and 63 respectively. Their whereabouts still remains a mystery to this day, and the fate of these three men perhaps may never be known. What made it even stranger is that when the Kaz 2 was eventually found by the Coast Guard, there were no signs of distress, no signs of boat damage or even a struggle between the three men. It was as if they just vanished out of thin air. Coffee cups were left out and all the life jackets on board remained stowed away, indicating that the trio never felt at risk. In an even more curious turn of events, rescue teams discovered video footage of the three men on a handheld camera, seemingly hours before they disappeared. It showed them fishing, relaxing in the sun with the motor off and offered no clues as to how these three experienced sailors disappeared at sea. Although an inquiry was later drawn no definitive conclusions were ever reached and only theories remain about the ultimate fate of the Kaz 2. Coming in at number 4, the Lady Loverbond. Of course no list would be complete without a good old sea shanty of jilted lovers and ghostly revenge. As the legend goes, the Lady Loverbond was a schooner that is alleged to have been wrecked on the Goodwin Sands just off the southern coast of Kent on the 13th of February 1749. But if you ask any old sailor worth their salt, they'll tell you that it just so happens to have a habit of reappearing every 50 or so years as a ghost ship. As the story goes, the captain of the ship, a man named Simon Reed, had just been married to his bride Annetta and was celebrating the joyous occasion with a cruise bound for Oporto in Portugal. Now it is high time to mention that a long standing sailor's superstition was that back in the day it was grave bad luck to bring a woman on board and in many ways the legend of the Lady Loverbond is a cautionary tale that exemplifies that fact. According to the tale, the ship's first mate, a man named John Rivers, was a rival for the hand of the captain's young wife and in a jealous fit of rage he killed the crewman manning the ship's wheel and steered the vessel into the treacherous Goodwin Sands killing absolutely everyone on board and if you're asking me that is a stark overreaction but nevertheless since that fateful day in 1749 the Lady Loverbond has been sighted on numerous occasions with an ethereal ghostly glow eternally bound to wander the ocean. Coming in at number 3 we have the Bermuda Triangle. Named for the triangular shape of around 500,000 square miles of ocean between Miami, Bermuda and Puerto Rico. For centuries the Bermuda
Bermuda Triangle has been mystified as a harrowing patch of ocean where sailors and pilots are prone to lose contact with the natural world and disappear forever. Back when Christopher Columbus first sailed the area, he claimed to see a giant ball of light in the sky that crashed into the horizon and made it glow. Soon after, all sorts of strange events happened in the area, including several boats mysteriously disappearing, and in one incident in 1945, an entire squadron of US torpedo bombers vanished into thin air due to all these weird instances, giving this place the name the Devil's Triangle. The exact number of ships and airplanes that have disappeared is not known, but it's estimated that around 50 ships and 20 planes have been victim to the Bermuda Triangle, and many of these mysterious disappearances of these ships and planes have never been recovered. Many see the Bermuda Triangle as a real phenomenon and have multiple theories to try and explain this mysterious place. And some of these theories are human error, paranormal explanations, violent weather like hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, which is a major surface current within the ocean, methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas that causes bubbles to form around the ship and ultimately sink it without warning. All of these are only theories and the Bermuda Triangle to this day is the most notorious sea legend of all time. In at number 2 we have the Gulf of Mexico's cursed shipwreck. An estimated 4,000 shipwrecks litter the seabed across the stretch of water, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the wealthiest locations for maritime archaeology in the world. In February 2001, oil workers for ExxonMobil were laying some pipeline when they happened to stumble upon a shipwreck about 2,600 feet deep. After discovering the wreckage, a team was assembled to explore this mysterious ship, but nothing seemed to go right. The exploration submarine malfunctioned right as it was getting ready to go down to check out the wreck, and that was only the beginning of these mysterious mysterious malfunctions. Others include video monitors going out whenever they fired their thrusters, sonars breaking and hydraulics going haywire with no explanation for any of these problems. After nothing working and things continuing to break, the Navy sent a researcher submarine down to investigate the wreckage, and on the way down it suddenly self-destructed, and somehow when it finally did get to the wreck, its arms were too short to reach anything. Six months later in July in 2002, a team working aboard the NR1 decided to launch a robotic sub down to the wreck site, but the malfunctions continued. The second the rover entered the water, it veered to the right and went out of control. The tether had caught in the propellers, which caused the vessel to smash into the underside of the ship and the rover was never recovered. Later in the summer of 2002, the curse would continue as a ship from Sustainable Sea Program of the NOAA offered to pick up artifacts from the site. The first time the vessel attempted to leave the dock, debris was lodged in the propeller. The second time the propeller locked and the ship ended up in dry lock, needing repairs. Over the years, many others have tried to learn more about this wreck, but little was found, and what was found wasn't at all helpful. To this day, nothing has been able to get too close to the shipwreck to investigate and explore the phenomenon and very little is known about this mysterious ship. Many believe the lives lost in the wreck continue to haunt the ship and will keep anyone and everything out of it at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have the unmapped ocean floor. This is truly one of the biggest mysteries, and humans' curiosity about the Earth's floor is centuries old. Much remains to be learned about the ocean, especially exploring the mystery of the deep sea. From mapping and describing the physical, biological, geological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean and understanding their dynamics. For centuries, scholars believed the deep sea to be a lifeless place until the late 19th century. We've discovered there is a diversity of life and creatures living down there. Many researchers and divers had tried to dive and take submarines down to explore more of this unknown place, but it's very hard due to the extremely cold temperatures, the darkness, and the literally bone-shattering pressure that's more than 1,000 times that at sea level. In 2019, a retired naval officer, Victor Vescovo, set a new record as one of the deepest dives to date, reaching almost 36,000 feet down in a submarine into the deepest place on Earth, the Marianas Trench. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, driving well weather, regulating temperature, and ultimately supporting all life's organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. But to this day, more than 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored, and it's still unknown how deep the ocean really is. Given the high degree of difficulty and cost in exploring our ocean using underwater vehicles, researchers have relied heavily on technologies such as sonar to generate maps of the seafloor, but currently less than 10% of the global ocean is mapped using modern sonar technology, and only about 35% of the United States have been mapped using modern methods. As we go deeper into the ocean floor, it's too 
deep for this modern technology because it's too remote and dark for this type of visual mapping. So if you go swimming in the ocean, it's very unknown of what is swimming and living below you. But scientists and researchers continue to develop technologies to unlock the many secrets of the ocean. The NOAA is working to increase our understanding of the ocean realm. Number 5 on this list is Julia. According to Wikipedia, Julia is a sound recorded on March 1st, 1999 by the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. NOAA said the source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that had run aground off Antarctica. It was large enough to be heard over the entire Equatorial Pacific Ocean Autonomous Hydrophone Array with a duration of about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Due to the uncertainty of the arrival azimuth, the point of origin could only be narrowed to between Bransford Straits and Cape Adar. The most accepted explanation is that a massive iceberg scraped along the ground, but in truth, it could be anything. This was a one off sound, so we'll likely never know for sure, but an iceberg, a massive animal, some underground volcanoes, maybe even tectonic plates shifting, all of these are potential explanations for why this sound may have come about, and none of them are great. This sound was huge, and if this is what it sounds like for tectonic plates to shift, then they're probably shifting around in ways that we don't really need them to be doing right now. Also, there was a rumor that NASA had photographs of the body of water that was suspected, and that there was a massive shadow in it. People believe that they may have been able to capture a photo of some giant creature down there but don't want to reveal such information to the public. If the creature is as big as people think, then I kind of understand why. Number 4 on this list is the upsweep. Schneider writes, Upsweep is an unidentified sound that's existed at least since the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory began recording SOSUS, an underwater sound surveillance system with listening stations around the world in 1991. The sound consists of a long train of narrow band upsweeping sounds of several seconds duration each, the laboratory reports. The source location is difficult to identify, but it's in the Pacific around the halfway point between Australia and South America. Upsweep changes with the seasons becoming loudest in spring and autumn, though it isn't clear why. The leading theory is that it's related to volcanic activity. This sound or signal is very unique because it keeps coming back and changes with the weather. Frankly, I don't really understand how this could possibly be related to volcanic activity because the season is dictating how loud or soft the noise is. Why would the fact that we're in fall change anything about a volcano's activity and therefore the sound? Is it it possible that this explanation is just an explanation of convenience and the fact of the matter is no one really has any idea why this is happening or maybe even worse they do know why it's happening and are just covering it up anyways. Coming in at number 3 we've got the ghost ship of the Northumberland Strait. Yes, Canadian Ghost Pirates. That pretty much sums up my career aspirations right there. I don't know if that means I would be pirating software related to ghosts or actually becoming a phantom upon the Northumberland Strait, but I don't really care as long as my title involves the words Canadian, Ghost, and Pirate. But back to the actual tale at hand, this ghost ship is said to sail when it's on fire within the Northumberland Strait. What is the Northumberland Strait? It is a body of water that separates Prince Edward Island from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in eastern Canada. Now you all know some Canadian geography. I'm so proud of you. The story dates back over 200 years when people started reporting a beautiful schooner catching fire and being engulfed in flames as people watched from shore. Anyone who has ever attempted a rescue mission finds that the ship completely disappears before they can reach it. Apparently the ship shows up before a northeast wind, forewarning terrible storms. Some say it's just an example of St. Elmo's fire, a rare weather condition involving the ionization of air molecules in order to produce a faint glow, but those who have seen the ship ablaze say that it was much too bright to be explained away like that. The prevailing story is that a pirate made a pact with the devil to protect and hide his treasure, and in return, he and his crew would sail forever on the burning ship. A pact was made as the ship was burning down and would soon sink along with the treasure. In the end, folks claim that their fate was revenge for the terrible deeds they had done in their days of piracy, like their own personal floating hell. Coming in at number 2 we have Baron Falkenberg, a tale of lovers scorned, brothers bashed and dice rolled. This pirate haunts Germany's North Sea and has been for over 600 years. Baron Falkenberg was a relatively wealthy member of high society, planning to propose to the village's most beautiful maiden. Then his long lost brother returned with newly found riches and proposed to her first. At the wedding, the Baron became so upset with his brother that he clubbed him over the head with a bottle of champagne. 
classy. Naturally, the brother dropped dead. Seeing this, his bride ran away, claiming that she'd rather die than be with the Baron. Ouch. So the Baron did what any rational fratricidal maniac would do, and stabbed her in the heart. How romantic. Then he ran away to the beach where he was accosted by a shady man on a boat. This mysterious figure invited him to the ship where he came from, which was anchored offshore a little ways out. The Baron accepted and rode his way to the Great Grey Behemoth. Since entering, nobody has seen him disembark and he's been at sea for centuries. The ship he boarded always seems to be heading due north and flickers of blue flame. Some passersby claim to have seen the Baron himself playing dice with the devil in order to take back control of his soul. Unfortunately, it appears to be very difficult to win a game of chance against the devil. An additional caveat that can be added is that there are those who will claim that the story of the Baron is also connected to a Norse ghost story. The story tells the tale of a Viking sea captain who stole a magic ring from the gods. As punishment for his crimes, he was turned into a living skeleton covered in fire, condemned to spend the rest of eternity affixed to the mast of a ghostly longship. Whether the two stories are about the same ship, it's hard to say. However, I think we can all agree that a flaming skeleton pirate is pretty badass. And finally at number one, we have the Flying Dutchman. We saved the most well known for last. The legendary ghost ship is said to glow with ghostly light as it sails the seven seas. It will attempt to send messages to land or to people long dead if hailed. Unfortunately, nobody really wants to hail this ship as the sight of it is seen to be a portent of doom. Like most ghostly ships, the Dutchman can never make port and is doomed to sail the oceans forever. It's theorized that the spectral seafarer had been rounding the treacherous Cape of Good Hope when it encountered a sudden storm. The hatches were battened down and the captain swore he would push right through come hell or high water and it turns out a little bit of both were on the menu. For his recklessness with his ship and crew, the captain was divinely punished. He was condemned to sail the seas for eternity, serving as a warning to other mariners of bad weather and the cost of hubris. Sightings of the Dutchman have been reported since the 18th century with many notable scallywags and scurvy dogs laying eyes on the ghastly vessel. Even Prince George of Wales described seeing a ship glowing with a strange light. If you see a ship with skeletons dancing in the rigging, steer clear. It might look like fun, but the captain will try to lure other vessels onto the rocks to ensure nobody else can pass the cape. Sheesh, remind me not to take a long sailing trip. Number five on this list is a mistake. So I know that's kind of weird, how do you discover a mistake? Well, in a story from One Dumb Diver, and yeah, that is their actual handle, they do just that. They write, When I was 15, I took the family boat out and dove the reef myself to clear my head. That was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of about 90 feet when I was only rated for 60. While diving, I spotted a 3.5 meter mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean and they only have two speeds. Curious, which is harmless, and lunch. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do since there was no way for me to escape it. Nowadays, we dive with sharp shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve, the idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, it occurred to me, that I'd left my sleeve on my bed. I had my knife drawn, however now I had a series of problems. I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and trailed blood everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt water and open wounds, they don't feel too good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing more than a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down into my tricep and detached it, and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. So that story right there, folks, is why I personally don't think I'm ever going deep sea diving. I love sharks, they're super cool, I love to learn about sharks, but I am more than happy to keep them in a tank at the aquarium and learn about them in that way. Swimming with them or discovering one in front of you on the day that you also forgot your protective gear, not something that sounds like a great time. Number four on this list is a barracuda. 
El Herrera 9519 writes, One time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace, and then slowly and calmly moved away from it, and it took off without bothering them anymore, but still pretty unsettling, and taught my mom to be a little bit more aware of her surroundings when diving. So I looked it up, and barracudas can grow to be 1.8 meters in length. Pair that with their extremely sharp teeth and the fact that shiny objects remind them of the little silver fish that they eat, and you have yourself in a pretty bad situation. The woman in this story is honestly extremely lucky that this fish waited to decide if it was going to attack or not. Most times she wouldn't have had time to respond and it would have just gone to take a bite. Considering this necklace would have been around her neck, having a barracuda bite into it could have ended very badly. Number three on this list is the hum. The hum is one of the most interesting signals from the deep ocean that we've ever run into. Caitlin Schneider writes, The hum has been recorded on several occasions, mostly during the last 50 years or so. In these cases, there have been reports of a relentless and troubling low-frequency humming noise that can only be heard by a certain portion of the population. It's difficult to pinpoint when instances of the hum began, but it's been well documented since the 1970s, and since then, cases have popped up all over the world from Ontario, Canada, to Taos, New Mexico, to Bristol, England, to Largue, Scotland, and Auckland, New Zealand. In most instances, the affected group only makes up 2% of the population, but for those individuals, the hum is largely inescapable and impossible to track. Those affected report never having heard noises before and say the hum is generally heard indoors and becomes louder at night. It's also most common in rural and suburban areas and among people between age 55 and 70. Scientists have long investigated the cause of the drone, occasionally tracing it to industrial equipment emitting particular frequencies. For the most part though, the sound has left the world world completely puzzled. The list of other possible culprits is long and wide ranging. Wireless communication devices, power or gas lines, electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, earth tremors, or the ocean are all suspects. Because the hum appears and disappears, and because the cause may vary from case to case, the phenomenon still baffles researchers. At this point, a few things are clear. The hum is real and likely a byproduct of 21st century living. They think that this sound might come from the ocean, but they're also really not that sure. This is one of those ones that just really doesn't make any sense. Caitlin writes at the end there that it might be a product of 21st century living, but I frankly don't understand that. How is our way of living causing this hum to come from the ocean all around the globe at totally random times? Also, why is it that people from the ages of 55 to 70 are more affected by this? It's stuff like this that reminds me that we aren't as smart as we think we are. Sometimes I think that we're so advanced that we have it all figured out, but then I'm reminded that there's just this massive hum that occasionally happens which nobody knows why. What it means or what it could do is all a mystery, which honestly adds to the scare factor. Number two on this list is skyquakes. So when you hear skyquakes, you probably don't think that they have anything to do with the water, but they actually do. Caitlin Schneider says that skyquakes or unexplained sonic booms have been heard around the world for the last 200 years or so, usually near bodies of water. These head scratchers have been reported on the Ganges in India, the East Coast and Inland Finger Lakes of the US near the North Sea, and in Australia, Japan, and Italy. The sounds which has been described as mimicking massive thunder or cannon fire has been chalked up to everything from meteors and entering the atmosphere to gas escaping from vents in the Earth's surface, or the gas exploding after being trapped underwater as a result of biological decay, to earthquakes, military aircraft, underwater caves collapsing, and even a possible byproduct of solar and or Earth-based magnetic activity. So there's a lot of explanations there, but I want to circle back to the one about gas getting trapped underwater. Apparently the gas gets trapped and then causes an explosion. Well, what if a ton of gas gets trapped? What if so much gas gets trapped that the explosion doesn't just cause a sound, but actually causes a catastrophic event? It leads to a huge tsunami that 
that just wipes out an entire city. If this is the explanation for the sound, then I don't see why that isn't possible. Which would mean that whenever we hear such a thing, it's just a potential natural disaster waiting to happen. All that makes it a pretty scary sound if you ask me. And finally, number one is the bloop. Potentially one of the most infamous sounds ever recorded from the ocean, the bloop has kept experts guessing for years. In 1997, a super low frequency but massively powerful sound was heard in multiple spots around the globe. Experts think that it originated off the coast of South Africa, but are not 100% sure. The fact that it was heard repeatedly over and over again during the summer of 1997, but then was never heard of after that. No one really knows what caused this massive sound and maybe the most terrifying part is that scientists haven't ruled out something organic. Something organic means something living. A massive, massive creature that would break records for anything that we've ever seen before. Far larger than a blue whale, the largest known creature on the planet. This would be groundbreaking if it was something organic and would totally change the way we look at the ocean. Conspiracy theorists have thought that the government does know what it is and is actually keeping it under wraps for fear of how the public will respond. Some people even believe that it might be Cthulhu, the ancient god written about in the Lovecraftian universe. Now once again, the most accepted explanation is that of a massive iceberg scraping the ground, but if that's what caused it, then why did it keep happening over and over again? Comment down below what you guys think is the true cause of this bloop, because I truly have no idea.